Christmas Eve, and welcome to Progressive Soup. With us, we have some very special guests. We have Mizuno, we have Franklin, we have Louisville, and we have Wilson. And we're going to be doing tonight, Twas the Night Before Christmas, a visit from Santa Claus. What's that? Oh, you want to hear a baseball story? Why would that be? Well, obviously Mizuno, Franklin, and uh, Louisville want to hear a baseball story. Wilson, I'm not quite sure. No, no, no football tonight, sorry. We're going to start. Okay, we'll do this. We will start with Twas the Night Before Christmas. And if you're good, little bats and gloves and balls, we will do a baseball story too. Let's start out. Twas the night before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And mom and her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. What one to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. And dry leaves that before the wild hurricanes fly, when they meet an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop, the courses they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkle I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down on a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he roared out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. You were so well behaved. We'll read a baseball story. Wilson? Really? All right. Fine. Suit yourself, buddy. It was a sultry Thursday afternoon in Fenway Park. The Red Sox were playing the New York Yankees, a marginally decent American League team. Born in Baltimore in 1901 and then reborn the New York Highlanders in 1903, the Yankees had been a shadow of the National League counterparts, the Giants and the Dodgers, for decades. The Giants, who played in the polo grounds, had been a powerhouse team, boasting the likes of Christy Mathewson and Mel Ott, the former an imposing figure on the mound, the latter an up-and-coming slugger that was bound to strike fear into the hearts of opposing pitchers for years to come. 
the home run was beginning to be viewed as not only a potent weapon, but also a true crowd pleaser. And the home run and the Brooklyn Dodgers, at least the Dodgers had some gleam of joy in the early 20th century history. After stumbling through the first 12 years of the new century, which began with Wee Willie Keeler as their only bright light in the dark wilderness, living in the long shadow cast by Manhattan's immense skyscrapers and the specter of over 100 losses in both 1905 and 1908. Then bottoming out in 1910 with the apocalyptic scene of Kaiser Wilhelm pitching in relief for them. Yes, Kaiser Wilhelm, that was his name. After Wilhelm, or at least his namesake, lit off for the oncoming spectacle of Germany's war machine in World War I, Brooklyn's fortune took a turn for the better with the arrival of Casey Stengel in 1913. Then Jack Coombs, Jeff Pfeffer, and Rube Marquardt who vaulted Brooklyn into first place in 1916. It was their first view from the top of the National League Keep since 1900, and with it came a World Series appearance. And Casey Stengel? He later hit the first postseason home run in a ballpark that would come to be known as the Stadium. The year was 1923 and the Stadium was new, and their crosstown rival, the New York Yankees, were their opponents. Casey thumbed his nose at the opponent's dugout unaware that one day he would be one of the best-loved managers of baseball's corporate behemoth, the New York Yankees. The Yankees of the early 20th century more closely resembled the team that came to share New York with the, with the 1903, the New York Giants, than they did the Brooklyn Dodgers, ah, nay, the Brookfield Robins. And even at that, the Boston Red Sox were light years ahead of either the Dodgers or the Yankees. However, the Highlanders, Yankees, had no stars at that juncture in their history. Other than the fading star Wee Willie Keeler, the Yankees could only muster the likes of a Snake Wiltsky on the mound, Monty Beville behind the plate, Patty Green, later to be joined by Bob Unglob on the infield, and Dave Fultz in the outfield, more apt to be cast in the roles of teammates of the mighty Casey, the former was a pudding, the latter was a fake, than the real Casey. Unfortunately for the Yankees, there was no Casey to be found on the Yankees bench, not yet at least. Sitting in the stands that day were a young girl and her father, Arthur Raymond Kelt. Arthur Raymond Kelt had always liked the Yankees. The name evoked patriotism at its best. It was the name that should have been taken by a Boston team, either the group that became the Red Sox or the National League team that became the Braves. The Boston Braves, later to become the Milwaukee Braves, and finally the Atlanta Braves, truly a model for the coming corporate world. Yes, the pencil necks at IBM would someday view the Braves as a role model, a sports team that understood the advantages of shuttling their team and players from city to city to city. That girl, Eileen Kelt Stevenson, my future mother, wasn't overly impressed by these groups of overgrown boys dressed up in baggy knickers and silly brimmed hats, throwing, catching, spitting, swinging a stick wildly at a ball, chasing each other around, spitting, mostly sitting around and spitting. She just didn't see how her dad and the rest of the crowd, mostly men, could get excited about these events unfolding before them. One thing she could look forward to was the seventh inning stretch. At that point in the proceedings, a relaxed calm would overtake the crowd. Perhaps they were finally realizing the stupidity of the events unfolding before them. At any rate, when the seventh inning stretch arrived, her dad would buy her popcorn, delivered in a silly conical shaped contraption that converted to a megaphone that the more mature folks in the stands would use to amplify their stale exhortations to whichever team they happen to support. And I'm gonna to have to pretend to be the conical shaped container now. Kill the umpire! We want a pitcher, not a belly itcher! You couldn't hit the broadside of a barn! And so the mercilessly banal taunts would continue. Well, at least the popcorn wasn't stale, Eileen thought. Just then, the popcorn vendor made his rounds near their seats. The wait would have been worthwhile until tragedy struck. Eileen's popcorn, 
the last in possession of the vendor, fell to the ground and was immediately crushed by the left foot of a loudish, half-crocked Irishman. This fine specimen of humanity would surely have offered to replace the little girl's popcorn if he had not at that very moment dropped his hip flask, which split in half. He watched in horror, as if his very life fluid were draining from his veins, as she watched her popcorn container kiss the soles of his staggering feet. He cast no aspersions nor heaped any blame on little Eileen. He merely rubbed his chin and spoke these words. If not for the fact that your family is not from our fair city, but from that fine glowing metropolis they call New York, I would surely replace this young waif's popcorn. However, as it appears, her clumsiness matches up quite well with your Yankee heroes, I'll not be. Arthur Raymond Kelt was ready to give the galumph of a man a piece of his mind when little Eileen squeezed his hand as if to say, I can take care of this oaf myself, Dad. And she did. Your fine Boston Red Sox, who don't deserve the right to call themselves Yankees, might as well cancel the rest of their games, for they will all be for naught, mister, because for every piece of popcorn that was felled by your hand, there would be a moment of heartbreak for your team. She reached down to pick up the container. As long as this container belongs to my Yankee adoring family, your team will wish they were my Yankees. Indeed, some of your outcasts will become my team's greatest players. My team is headed for greatness, while your team will suffer again and again. Of course, halfway through this wor words of admonishment, Joe Buckner had fallen into a whiskey stupor, and the rest of the world around her was watching the home team's bottom of the seventh, which included a breathtaking home run by a spindly-legged pitcher whose teammates called the Babe. Now, we forward 86 years. The curse has been laid upon the Red Sox by my mother, Eileen Kelt Stevenson. Forward to 2004. Another Red Sox Nations year was arriving at a sad conclusion. Fenway Park was awash in sweet red bunting, but the mood of the crowd was definitely a sour one. The hated Yankees had moved to the brink of another elimination game for the Red Sox, and the march of history had added another Batan-like moment. The American League Championship Series stood at three games to none with the Red Sox on the short end of the proverbial stick. The fans in the stands were prepared for the annual wake. Somewhere in Connecticut, the home of Dick and Lori Lofgren had scheduled a routine plumber call during the day. The toilet in the upstairs bathroom had been running constantly for weeks. The slow drip, 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 which caused Eileen Stevenson's sister Lori no end of consternation. Lori had always been the most frugal one of the four Kelt children, plus she had always been the most environmentally conscious child, raised by Arthur Raymond and Mirabel Kelly Kelt. The Milford Audubon Society had been Lori's home away from home for many years, she became a volunteer there after uh, she closed her in-home business, the Jack and Jill Nursery School. Decades of small feet, small hands, small toys, scampering across the floor, and small buttocks sitting on the two toilets in the house had made both the seats and the flushing mechanisms worn. A three-day getaway to Goose Pond was on Dick and Lori's itinerary. One last glimpse of New Hampshire's glorious fall foliage with no thoughts of a stopover in Boston on the way. As Lori and Dick packed up for the trip, the plumber arrived with her apprentice. Lynn Tabersack had been a hero to Lori Lofgren for 25 years. Lynn's plumbing expertise and willingness to help out her friend for a reasonable price had kept her busy six days of the week while allowing her to augment her husband Bob's teaching salary and raise her son Joseph. Joe would have made a fine plumber's apprentice but his heart was set on following his mother's lead in another direction, civic involvement. Lynn had been the representative in Connecticut's General Assembly for Connecticut's 109th District years earlier. When she first won her seat in 1982, Lori's nephew, David, me, had volunteered for door-to-door -door campaigning and had later introduced Lynn to Lori. So, Lynn arrived and Lori and Dick continued to pack. Lynn addressed Lynn by her nickname, 
Freddie, in honor of Lynn's affection for the Red Sox stellar left fielder in the 1970s and 1980s. And Lynn went to work on a leaky toilet with her apprentice, Teddy Buckner. Now, you may note that it was Joe Buckner that was the one that stepped on the popcorn and began the curse. In 1986, along the way, a fellow by the name of Bill Buckner, who was a marvelously great, marvelously fielding first baseman, had a ground ball hit by Mookie Wilson go through his legs, which was part of the tragedy of the Red Sox story. Now we come to the next generation, Teddy Buckner. Teddy was a strapping young lad, but his plumbing skills were just a squirt short of a jigger, if you know what I mean. Teddy had come, here comes the pipe wrench, Lynn said, as she slid that same wrench along the floor, carefully covering, carefully covered by the canvas tarp, which Lynn had been using on every job which Teddy accompanied her since she cracked the Gilhuli ceramic tile near their kitchen sink. The wrench slid along the floor and right through Teddy's stubby legs. I'm sorry, Lynn, Teddy began to say as the wrench bumped against the basement heating, the baseboard heating. He quickly picked up the wrench and began to turn off the valve to the toilet. Lynn rolled her eyes, careful not to let Teddy see her do so. Keep working on your eye-hand coordination. One day you'll be as good as your Uncle Bill. Teddy took offense at the not-so-subtle reference to his Uncle Bill's stellar career at first base. Minus one forgettable moment. Teddy's ballpark skills matched up better with his grandpa Joe than with his Uncle Bill. Teddy went about his work and soon Lori and Dick's toilet had a new flushing mechanism. You were right to call me, Lori, Lynn went on. You wouldn't, want your, uh, you wouldn't want your upstairs toilet leaking for three days while you were away. Water's a pesky thing and gravity conspires to do incredible damage wherever they go. Lori shuddered. Your water bill could go through the roof and we could be partly responsible for a water shortage. Lori was always conscious about the environment and socially responsible. That is what bonded her to Lynn. The Red Sox took the field that evening. Now, again, we know the Yankees are ahead three games to nothing. And it's another one of those years for the Red Sox. The Red Sox took the field that evening in Fenway Park for their annual death watch. They had conducted themselves admirably during the regular season, finishing with the second most wins in the American League, second most to the Yankees, 101 wins. Then they had vanquished the Los Angeles, California, Anaheim Angels in three straight games, setting up another duel to the death with the Yankees. The Yankees had won four baseball world championships in the previous eight years and 26 world championships since the last banner had flown over Fenway Park. Yankee fans paid handsome sums of money to sit in Fenway Park over the years there to taunt the Bo Sox players and fans while vaunting their own players. They screamed out, 1986! They screamed out, 1918! They screamed out, Babe Ruth! And their greatest joy came when they screamed out, Bill Buckner! Game one, two and three of this championship series had been the epitome of Yankee glee, Red Sox doler. Three straight Yankee wins, the third by a crushing 19 to 8 score. The Red Sox took the field the way nine pallbearers would approach their own casket. The route was on. Back at Lori and Dick's home, a steady drip continued. The day before, the best teammate the Red Sox had ever had, better than Williams, better than Yastrzemski, better than Fred Lynn, better than Jim Rice, better than Johnny Pesky, better than Jim Lomborg, maybe even better than Bill Buckner himself, and certainly better than the likes of Manny Ramirez, David Ortiz, and the rest of the Red Sox 2004 cast of losers, had nicked the baseboard in Laurie and Dick Lofgren's bathroom. Teddy Buckner's through the legs error had begun an undoing of 86 years of torture. A full day's worth of Milford's precious lifeblood, its water supply had found itself, found its way down the pipe, through the walls and into the lower level of the Lofgren split level home. Downstairs were all the toys, all the books, all the wonderful drawings from 25 years of the Jack and Jill nursery. And downstairs was the popcorn container. The bottom of the ninth inning of game four arrived. 
Mariana Rivera, the slim contestant relief pitcher, took the mound to defend an equally slim Yankees lead. As Rivera walked to the mound, the first molecules of water, which by now had filled three feet of Laurie and Dick Lofgren's basement, reached the shelf holding the popcorn container. Kevin Millar, a player better known for winning the annual sausage and pepper eating contest outside Fenway Park than for his baseball heroics, led off with a single. The, sing the signal came from the dugout for a pinch runner, and Millar gladly headed for the tunnel and the kielbasa stand. Dave Roberts, with speed and spindly legs equal to the Bambinos, Babe Ruth's, took his lead off first and promptly stole second. In the ninth inning of the 1927 World Series, Babe Ruth had recorded the final out in the Yankees' loss to the St. Louis Cardinals, caught trying to steal second. But here, it's 2004, and Kevin Millar singles, Dave Roberts runs from him, steals second. Bill Muller approached the batter's box. Twice earlier in the season, the Red Sox had beaten Rivera, once on a hit by Bill Muller. Rivera smiled knowing that evening, even lightning never strikes more than twice. Mahler responded by wiping the smile off Rivera's countenance, stroking a single to drive in Roberts. The ghost of Babe Ruth, don't get scared. The ghost of Babe Ruth, standing between third base and home plate, tried to trip Roberts on the way past him, but was distracted by the hot dog and beer and popcorn vendors in the left field stands. That perfect storm was the Babes and Mo Rivera's undoing. Even at that, the Yankees and Red Sox remained tied entering extra innings. Behind three games to zero, there would not be any instant gratification for these Red Sox, as modern day ballplayers like to be mollycoddled, like the previous year's Yankees team, which gloated over these same Red Sox after Aaron Boone's game winning, uh, uh, game seven walk off home run in 2003's version of Red Sox agony. The game dragged on, as the story did. <laughs> In the 11th inning, the Yankees appeared to be ready to strike a death blow. Bernie Williams strode to the plate with the bases loaded and two outs. You could almost see the Williams on his shirt reconfigure into Dent, as in Bucky Dent. On a pitch which Williams would normally smash with the aplomb of a major chord off his guitar, a drop of ink ink-stained water fell into his eye. The popcorn container was disintegrating, and with it, the curse. He swung for the fences and another mercilessly taunting, merciless taunting of the Bow Sox, but the drop of ink-stained water had blurred his vision enough to turn his home run into a routine fly ball. The game remained tied. Now, this, that's the 11th inning. In the 12th inning, David, Big Poppy, as you know him, Big Poppy Ortiz, who had gorged himself on the bench in the bottom of the ninth inning with two spinach and sausage grinders, followed by a gallon of sweet nectar from Gray's Papaya on Amsterdam Avenue and 72nd Street in New York, sent to him by the Lofgren's younger brother, Herbert Raymond Kelt, who lived across uh, Central Park on East 80th Street, flexed his muscles, David Ortiz flexed his muscles, became Big Popeye, and ended the game with a dramatic home run. The call had come from the governor. The execution was postponed. Now it's three games to one, Yankees, which is still an improbable, if not impossible, comeback for the Red Sox on the horizon. The SS popcorn container set sail on its maiden voyage from the shelf three feet from the bottom of newly created Lake Lofgren just as a national anthem prior to Game 5 was completed. The crowd in Fenway Park couldn't have cared less about the boat, unless it interfered with their view of the game. The little boat sailed merrily across the lake until it realized two important facts. Number one, it had no crew. Number two, it in no way resembled or shaped like a real boat. A crew would have redirected the faux rowboat back into port or would have been panicked and jumped overboard after dooming it by running from port to starboard from stem to stern, screaming asinine remarks like, oh, the humanity, 
Of course, this type of epithet was much too high-minded for any baseball audience. A mere 16 hours had elapsed since the Red Sox completed their miraculous resuscitation the night before. 15 hours of drinking in the respective clubhouses and one hour of sleep. The Red Sox and Yankees players both drank to celebrate the impossible and the inevitable. The ghosts of Babe Ruth and Joe Buckner mingled freely in the, both clubhouses and the liquor in both clubhouses mysteriously vanished at a faster than humanly possible rate. No one can imagine whether the Babe and the Joe discussed life and death or fist fought or maybe did a little of both. One hour of drunken sleep seemed to suffice both teams as they created the longest game in postseason baseball history. Either five hours and 49 minutes, or if you look back to 1918, or 753,666 hours and six minutes and six seconds, depending on your dimensional perspective. The Red Sox made their historic run to tie the game against Mario and Rivera, Rivera earlier this time on a Jason Veritek sacrifice fly in the eighth inning. In the bottom of the 14th inning, David, Big Poppy Ortiz, again stuffed his mammoth craw, this time with only one spinach and sausage grinder plus two gallons of papaya enzymes and sloshed to the plate with spinach stuck in between his, the gaping hole in his two front teeth and a distinct papaya stain on the front of his pants. The baseball found another big poppy gaping hole in the catatonic Yankee infield. However, the infield dirt seemed to be muddy from a gush or two of papaya juice and whiskey, courtesy of many overstuffed and under-toileted ball players. Derek Jeter could have strolled over and leisurely picked up the ball and thrown to first as Big Poppy trudged and dribbled down the first baseline. But something or someone accompanied Jeter on his odyssey making the teetotaling Jeter light-headed and lethargic. Johnny Damon scored, and a second call from the governor let the Red Sox live to see another dawn. And you all seem very tired, so we're going to send you off to bed. Perhaps we'll finish the story a little bit later. They're all asleep. How long have they been asleep? Oh, all right, again, Merry Christmas. This is Progressive Soup. Enjoy your Christmas. Kids. Oh, kids.